So now that we see the three examples of cases that limits do not exist, uh, we can kind of, you know, summarize them down below. So conditions in, under which limits do not exist. The limit of f of x as x approaches c does not exist when any of the conditions listed below are true. f of x approaches a different number from the right side of c than it approaches from the left side. So that was really the problem with both of these ones. They approach different values from uh, either side. Uh, number two, f of x increases or decreases without bound as x approaches c. So really that's, that's the first one also. Um, and then number three, f of x oscillates between two fixed values as x approaches c. So again, that was the last one. Okay, so let's take a look at one more table one, and then we'll look at some properties which go along with this. So I'm going to first, let's fill in our x's. We're approaching zero, so we'll be a little bit smaller, a little bit larger, and we'll lose a zero and another zero. Okay, so let's turn this baby on. Let's clear that. Let's get our y, which should be 2 over x to the third. Okay, 2 over x to the third. So now let's get our table. And so, well, actually, all of those values of x are what we want. So that looks pretty good. So let's write those down. So we have negative 2,000, negative 2 times 10 to the 6, negative 2 times 10 to the 9th, 2 times 10 to the 9th, 2 times 10 to the 6, and 2,000. So, what's your conclusion here? What's the limit as x approaches 0 for this? So we can see we got a really huge negative number. We got a really huge positive number. They're not approaching the same number. So in this case, it does not exist. So again, we can use the graphs. We can also use the table still, and they should corroborate each other. All right, so now this next part gets into the properties of limits and direct substitution. So we didn't really itemize that or, or you know point that out specifically, but there's going to be cases where we can just directly substitute the number in and we'll get the limit out of it. So here's some cases where that is going to happen. So if we have the limit of B as X approaches C, that limit should be equal to B. And the reason why is because what is that function look like? B is a constant. So if you have y equals b, that's going to be a horizontal line. So no matter what value of x you're approaching, it's always at that same value of b. So that's why that limit is the way it is. <clears throat> if we have the function y equals x, well, we know y equals x is just a diagonal line. So no matter what value of c you are, if you have a value of c here, you're going to have the corresponding y value is going to be the same, the same value. So, so no matter what value of x you have, you're just going to plug that value in, and that will be your limit. Very similar for x to the n power. You're just plugging it in. And for square roots, the same thing. You plug it in. So those are some basic limits that we can now use. And then some other properties of limits. If we have a constant times a function, we can just multiply the constant times the limit. If f, the limit of f of x is equal to L, and the limit of g of x is equal to k, so we can just multiply the constant times the limit. Same thing here. If we're adding or subtracting two functions, and we're taking the limit, the limit's going to be the sum or the difference of those actual limits. Product will give us the product. Quotient will give us the quotient. Power will give us the power. So again, very straightforward 
um, properties that we can see with the limits. Now, in many cases, we can su simply substitute the value of c into the function to find the limit. These are, limits are found by direct substitution. The condition for a limit to be of this type is that the function must be continuous. No breaks in the graph at c. So that's why we could have done that. Let me flip back here to this problem. This problem didn't have a hole. So we could have used direct substitution to evaluate this. Had we plugged in 2 for x, 3 minus 2 is 1. Done. You don't have to even draw a picture or anything. But the only reason why is because there's no holes at x equals whatever you're approaching. So we're going to see that in action right now. So... Um, again, a couple more properties, but they're really essentially the same types of things we've seen already. So determine each limit if it exists. So the limit of 5 as x approaches 14. So remember, the constant is just the constant function, horizontal line. So no matter what x we approach, it's still going to be approaching 5. Here, essentially, we can just try direct substitution. That's really the only thing you can do for these problems is just try it and see what you get. If you get something crazy, then more than likely you can't use direct substitution. So let's see what happens if we just substitute it in. So we have the square root of 5 times 3 squared minus 9, which is the square root of 45 minus 9, which is the square root of 36, which is 6. Nothing really seems out of the ordinary with that. So, you know, if we wanted to graph this, we could see that it's going to give you a continuous graph. There's not going to be any holes in it or anything. There's no fractions or something. So more than likely, this is your limit. You're done. Let's see what happens with this one. So we're approaching zero. So we have three times zero minus one over two times zero plus five. So those are going to cancel. So it looks like it's just going to be negative one-fifth. All right. <clears throat> so now this last one, if we try direct substitution, we plug in one, we get one squared minus one, one minus one, uh-oh, we get zero over zero. But we're going to find ways that we can tackle this algebraically. We don't have to graph these. So, and if you're Looking at these suspiciously, you can probably see there's a trick that allow us to do some canceling. But we're going to go explore that in much more detail in the next section. So, see you in the next videos.